Gary began his PhD at 19 years of age under uh, Steven Pinker, and he was awarded his PhD at 23. Uh, he won the American Psychological Foundation Award for New Investigators in Cognitive Development with his work on neuroscience and cognition. Gary is, is uh, Emeritus Professor at uh, NYU, founder of Geometric Intelligence, which was acquired by Uber, and more recently, founder of Robust AI. He is, of course, a pioneer in the field of neurosymbolic AI. He wrote many books, and uh, including The Algebraic Mind, uh, already an early uh, identification of key issues with neural networks, uh, already, for instance, is studying uh, relational learning with variables uh, in neural networks. Uh, and more recently, um, rebooting AI with Bernie Davis, very current, addressing aspects of trust in deep learning and hybrid systems. This one is signed. Um, so Gary, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk. Uh, this early morning talk for you. The floor is yours. Thanks. Great. Uh, you can see me and see if I can share a screen and we're ready to go. I have too many open windows. All right. Can you all see my, my slides? Can't see anybody yes, else. Yes, yes, of course. All right. I don't know why I can't see anybody else anymore. I'd rather be able to see you, but and myself, uh, why is Zoom is uh, being recalcitrant. All right, well, if you can see me, I guess that's good enough. Um, the title of my talk is, is Towards a Proper Foundation for Robust Artificial Intelligence. I think we already have a foundation for some kind of artificial intelligence. I'm not quite sure what, and I'm not very happy with what it is, and I'd like to see us do better. Oh, I know I, I can't see anybody else. Where do I? No, I don't. Hang on. All right, well, we'll just do what we have to do. Um, <clears throat> part of the impetus for this talk is the report probably most of you saw from Stanford recently, um, massive 100 page or 200 page report um, on laying the groundwork for responsible foundation models. And the report got a lot of attention because it's from Stanford and uh, Stanford is a big deal and uh, particularly in AI. And whoops, he, here's a picture of the report. I think it's worth looking at to see the state of the art with where we are with AI. But I took exception and Ernie Davis and I took exception to the title of it. Um, and particularly this notion of uh, foundation model. And not just, it's not just that I took exception. I didn't really like um, calling <coughs> models like BERT and GPT-3 foundation models, but it, it also prompted a question, which is what do we actually want for foundation? So in their particular case, what they were talking about in this report as a foundation model, what they meant by foundation was simply that you took a lot of neural network data you a lot of data trained it on a neural network at broad scale and your model was in some sense adaptable to a wide range of downstream tasks so you could say that this neural network model is a foundation on which you build other things i think that was the sense in which they use the word foundation but it, it made arnie davis and i think about what do you actually want for a foundation i assume everybody here knows <coughs> gpt3 and how it operates but in brief, you see a little bit of text, the system sees a bit of text, something like that, and then it predicts a continuation for that. And there is a view out there, which <laughs> I saw on a t-shirt on Twitter, which says scale is all you need. The AGI is coming and that we just need more and more data. And if you believe that, <laughs> then models like GPT-3 might actually be the foundation for artificial intelligence, but I don't believe it. And I wanna tell you why and say something about what else I think we need to do. <clears throat> so Davis and I wrote a short article that I'm gonna go through today 
called Has AI Found a New Foundation in uh, a newspaper that's primarily published by Stanford graduate students, website, I guess you call it, uh, the gradient.pub, excuse me, I'm right back. Uh, so we wrote this piece and, and you can see from the image that <coughs> the general point was that we think the current AI models are a shaky foundation for AI. The question is, what, what do we even mean by a foundation? Are ne large neural network models really a good foundation for AI? Well, the question is, what is a foundation? What I would say is the foundation is something like the bedrock on which a larger structure is built. And neural networks to me seem more like quicksand. So <coughs> above all else, the foundation should be reliable. And these large neural network models are definitely not reliable. And I'll give you some examples. You've probably seen some. Here's one Davis and I came up with about a year ago. We, I should say OpenAI never has given us access to GPT-3, but some kindly stranger gave us access for an hour or two and we came up with some tests. Um, <coughs> here's an example. You poured yourself a, a glass of cranberry juice, but then absentmindedly you poured about a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay, you try sniffing it, but you have a bad cold, so you can't smell anything. You're very thirsty, so, and then GPT-3 continues it, <coughs> you drink it, which is a perfectly statistically plausible continuation. And then it says, you are now dead. And maybe the words dead and you can't smell anything are correlated in the database, but nobody has ever died from pouring grape juice into their cranberry juice. So it's not at all plausible from a conceptual um, or physical or physiological sense. Here's another example uh, that I saw uh, from <coughs> actually from Jan LeCun. Um, human says, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. Uh, GPT-3 says, I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with it. GPT, uh, human rather, continues, should I ki kill myself? And the human, uh, I'm sorry, then GPT says, I think you should. So again, the statistics in the database may license this. Maybe um, when people say, should I, often the answer is, I think you should. But when they say, should I kill myself? Presumably this is not the correct answer. Here's uh, some more examples to give you a second to read while I take a sip. Um, so you can see that uh, this is Replica, which is now running on GPT-3 from what I understand it. You have 5 million downloads and it spreads lots and lots of misinformation. Another example from Allison Ettinger, um, I should say 2020 here, um, did a formal study <coughs> of BERT asking questions like a robin is a blank and the system would give you the statistically plausible continuation, a bird. But then you <coughs> stick in the word not, you wind up in exactly the same place. A robin is not a blank. That's telling you the system has no clue about what negation is. Here's a real world example. I'm not actually sure GPT is the cause of it, but it is uh, um, whatever the underlying mechanism is. Uh, it's a sign the current AI is not very good. Um, I found this uh, on Twitter. The, someone showed the Google search summary versus the actual page for answers for how, how to seizure now what. And on the left, it says um, you should hold the person down or stop their movements, blah, 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 blah. The actual advice has the words do not, um, which happened to be, I guess, in a different font. But the system that has inferred what you should do has plagiarized every word except the most important two words at the top, do not. This is not what we want a reliable AI system to do. For an AI system can't understand the difference between doing something and absolutely not doing it. This is not what we want. Here's yet another example. This one's from uh, Ken Church, who does have access to GPT-3. Um, and he put in as an example, animals have a limited lifespan from a few weeks to a blank. And the system starts off with a good continuation to a few years. They're born, they grow, they, they reproduce, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets in an infinite loop a little bit further down. They are not infallible. They are not perfect. They're not infallible. They're not perfect. They're not infallible. And I saw that a lot playing with GPT-2 and it's apparently quite common uh, with GPT-3. And presumably part of the explanation is any particular continuation to any particular phrase <coughs> partway through is plausible. It's a plausible uh, continuation. They are not infallible. So they are not perfect and vice versa. But the infinite loop shows that the system has no contextual understanding of say human discourse and why you shouldn't repeat yourself. Uh, here's another example. This is from Clip, OpenAI's uh, <coughs> uh, visual model. 
and it does perfectly well in identifying a Granny Smith in a somewhat crowded scene, except if you put a piece of paper with the word iPod in front of it, and now it thinks that what you have is an actual iPod, um, go figure, um, <coughs> and not an Apple. And it's <coughs> there's something deeper about this mistake, which is not just that it gets it wrong or that it's fooled, it's that these kind of systems can't actually give you the right answer. They're so constrained to doing a forced choice winner take all that the only thing they can do is to choose between these two choices. Whereas a human could give you something more subtle and say something like, well, it looks to me like there's a piece of paper with the word iPod in front of an apple. If they really had to choose, they'd say an apple with paper in front of it or something like that. Um, but these systems, all they do is classify things. You know, that's classification has been useful for many things, but if you need something more subtle than one of the pre-trained outputs, it's problematic. The deepest point here, I think, is that the word deep and deep learning doesn't have anything to do with our lay sense of what deep learning might be. Our, our lay sense is that deep might mean conceptually deep, but the reality is all that deep means is a number of layers in a neural network. And so um, here, for example, uh, Ernie Davis and I came up with this one. <coughs> we trained some neural, or well, we use some off the shelf neural network that had been trained on lots of pictures of elephants, presumably like this, and it can recognize other elephants. But if you show it an elephant that looks different, it's going to have a problem. So what the system is really learning is statistics about texture and things like that. And if you take away <coughs> the common texture and leave a silhouette, the system hasn't even learned a basic thing like that a trunk is an identifiable characteristic and it can't reason about it. So what we have is deep learning, but what we really need is deep understanding. Why does this even matter? Well, I think that AI has a hype problem and that we as a field have to take responsibility for that um, hype problem. So that's the, the first issue. So for example, when Jeff Hinton said, it's just completely obvious that within five years, and he said this in, in 2016, that deep learning is gonna be better than radiologists. A lot of radiologists took that seriously. A lot of uh, potential radiologists took that seriously. And now we don't actually have enough radiologists and we have not in fact solved radiology with deep learning. Musk has been making crazy predictions about Tesla self-driving cars for years and years. Um, they just pulled a beta the other night and, you know, he said things like, well, by 2020, I think this was in 2019, um, Tesla's autonomous system will have improved to the point where the drivers will not have to pay attention to the road. Well, we all know that <coughs> we're still a long way from uh, getting to there. Reality um, is, is, for example, there are hundreds of startups working on radiology, but not, no actual radiologists have, have uh, been replaced. And of course, we still need human drivers to pay attention. Um, here's an article from Technology Review by Will Heaven. Um, hundreds of AI tools have been built to catch COVID. None of them actually help. That, that's a mind boggling statistics when you compare the amount of hype that we've had around AI and indeed amount of hype we had around AI with respect to COVID, um, none of them have actually made a difference. There are tons and tons of other problems that follow from just using superficial statistics to do your AI. So you know, here's an example someone uh, provided to me on Twitter um, that I, I retweeted, I guess, or, or brought the public attention, which was, <coughs> um, I believe this is in Polish, um, a set of sentences, all of which used a pronoun that's ambiguous between he and she. And what came back was, she is beautiful, he is clever, he reads, she washes the dishes, he builds, and so forth, um, which is perpetuating whatever stereotypes are already there um, <clears throat> and not great. And then after I put that out on Twitter, lots of other people replicated the same kind of phenomena in many other languages. If you haven't read this paper, you should on the dangers of stochastic parrots, can language models be too big? And the, the point is that simply mimicking the input is not getting us to AI. Um, of course, everybody knows about these problems by now. Um, and I, I saw this thing in the next web uh, a few weeks ago, DeepMind is working on the toxic language problem. <laughs> and I was sort of amused by the what came out. Go DeepMind tells Google what? That it has no idea how to make AI less toxic. Well, I think if you're at this conference, you might have some idea, which is I think we need a neurosymbolic 
approach. We are not going to be able to put the right kind of foundations on the so-called foundation models on these large pre-trained language models. We need to do something else. Um, I just saw this headline in the Wall Street Journal. Facebook says AI will clean up its plot. The platform, its own engineers have doubts. Um, it's not often that I get to say, I told you so to a public figure, but I told Zuckerberg that in the New York Times in 2018, in an op-ed that said, no, AI won't solve the fake news problem, at least not for decades to come. Sorry, Mr. Zuckerberg. He didn't listen and he's put in billions of dollars trying to solve the fake news problem with current AI. And we just don't, don't have the tools for it. The fundamental reality of contemporary AI, I think, is that we mostly use deep learning and it mostly works well with routine things, but it works very poorly with unusual cases. And so we go out into the long tail and <coughs> it's a problem. I see someone has asked me why we should care about what people say on Twitter or Facebook or, or Reddit. Well, we take responsibility um, as uh, people in the field for what the public thinks and things happen as a consequence of what the public thinks. So for example, when Jeff Hinton said that, uh, you know, we might as well stop training radiologists. A lot of people stopped going into radiology. Now we have a radiology shortage, a shortage of radiologists. I should say that more carefully, or people believe their self-driving cars actually are self-driving cars rather than just, um, human augmentation. And they take their hands off their wheel or they fall asleep. And so the public perception of these things matters a lot. That's number one. Um, number two is people apply the technologies that we build. And if they don't do the things that the public expects, then dangerous thing um, can happen. And yes, as, as Ken Church, whose example I used a moment ago, uh, sa says in the chat, um, hype is a leading indicator of AI winters. We are also all risking another AI winter. When people realize that the self-driving cars are probably going to be a failure at least anytime soon after all the hype and chatbots have been pretty much a failure. AI for COVID has been pretty much a failure. At some point, the investors are going to pull out their money. The big companies are going to pull out their money. Um, and that's going to be a problem for the field. Um, well, we can talk about that later. Um, here's, here's one la last example for now. Um, this is why we train autonomous cars in San Francisco. Um, it is true that if you are in a regime that is driven entirely by big data and superficial processing, you really need your outlier cases in the database. It is unfortunately not true that we have systems that know anything to do with them. So um, Benedict Evans, who's a leading venture capitalist at Andreessen, uh, posted the thing on le the left on Twitter, and then <coughs> um, David Hobb posted on the right um, <coughs> an example of what ImageNet actually did with a car covered with stickers. Not very well. So first part of the talk, the summary is simple. Deep learning is a better ladder. We all should be using it, at least for now, um, until such time as it's replaced with something better. Um, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. And I've been saying that for a really long time. So what would be better? The book Rebooting AI is basically trying to point the field in directions that we think are useful. We don't have all the answers. We don't pretend that we have all the answers. It's sort of like we're saying we should be looking to the West instead of the East. It's a very broad general direction, but we go through a lot of specific cases where we think things don't work and try to suggest what they would look, <coughs> look like if they were better. Um, and I'll go through some of the lessons from that book. Um, the first one is simply, we don't need to toss deep learning. Everybody likes to, everybody who hasn't read our book anyway, um, likes to dismiss the book by saying we're, we're getting rid of deep learning. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, <coughs> we don't need to get rid of it. We need to find ways to supplement it. And I had this uh, piece in 2018 for which I was attacked viciously by Jan LeCun and many others. Um, and the center claim there was actually that we need to reconceptualize deep learning, not as a universal solvent, but simply as one tool among many. And I think there is a growing realization a few years later that that's the case. And of course, a lot of people um, at, at this conference, I think, realize that. Um, deep learning is reasonably good for perception, not great. I mean, the, the Apple and the iPod is an example where even in perception it fails and not particularly relevant at all for things like common sense, planning, analogy, um, language reasoning. I know we can get in a fight about um, the language <coughs> and the planning parts. But I don't think it's the right tool for the, those jobs. It might actually have some role to play in each of these domains, but it's not 
by itself sufficient, I think, for any of them. Yes, I completely agree with what Lewis just uh, put that in the chat, large language models are called models. They are models in some sense, but they entirely lack a semantics. Um, and that really limits their use in classic problems of language, like language production relative to some prior notion that you're trying to express or in language understanding, getting to a semantics. Um, and yes, I fully agree. It's a, it's a major research avenue to <coughs> pursue. This next um, picture is a wild oversimplification that we used in the book, but it, I think it still has some merit, even though you can argue about, I think, literally every piece of it. Um, but the, the basic point is that we need to realize that AI is actually a very complicated thing, has room for a lot of different uh, techniques. Deep learning <coughs> is an example of machine learning. It may someday be replaced. Um, for now, it's the best we've got for handling large data. And we will always have that. Uh, challenge of, of ha handling large data. Maybe we'll find more efficient ways to do it. <coughs> Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It is astonishing how often I'm, I show this graph to the general public and people actually have thought that deep learning equals machine learning equals artificial intelligence. That is the default assumption, I think, in the general public and even among like journalists and so forth. And maybe there's a tiny recognition that something else, but so many people talk about these things as if they're interchangeable. This goes back to the question about AI hype and, and so forth. Um, if, if people don't understand these basics, um, it, it's problematic. I also agree with the other thing Lewis Lamb just said, which is that large language models can be consistent with previous data, but in terms of their syntax and not their semantics. I think that's absolutely right. So I wrote an article um, <coughs> last year, uh, <coughs> which I think got lost a little bit um, when COVID became um, clearly a threat right around the same time as the article came out, but it was called The Next Decade in AI, Four Steps Towards Robust Artificial Intelligence. And the argument there started with the argument that I just gave you. And then I tried to propose what I said was a hybrid knowledge-driven reasoning-based approach centered around cognitive models. I said, this is the direction that the field really needs to go through. <clears throat> uh, maybe somebody can ask me about Benjo at the end. I don't wanna in interrupt the thread enough to answer that question immediately. Um, so hybrid, hybrid approach. We can get to AI, we can trust, sorry, we can't get to AI we can trust by relying on deep learning alone. That was the first part of today's talk. Clearly deep learning, or maybe some replacement down the road is good for some kinds of learning, um, a lot of kinds of learning, but it's poor for abstraction. So it's very good at learning relationships between features, but not between abstract variables. Classical AI is not gonna get us to robust AI, at least, by itself either. It's good for abstraction. Um, it's been less good for learning. I think the last talk was actually about ILP, which is I think one promising uh, thing to think about. Um, what we really need are hybrid models that bring together the two traditions. Um, this is in part because in the book that, that Artur uh, mentioned earlier, my first book, The Algebraic Mind, um, I pointed out an extrapolation problem. This is something that Benji and I do agree about now, but when I first told him about it in 2014 at NIPS, he thought I was an idiot. Um, he has he since, I think, really echoed the, the problem. W what I showed in 2001 and 1998 um, was, and I think a couple of people have shown this independently, but, and many people know it now, is if you train on a space of examples, you can generalize within that space, we'll call it for simplicity now interpolation, and have a lot of trouble extrapolating beyond it. So the simple example I gave back then <coughs> with a simple multi-layer perceptron was <coughs> the identity function. If I train you on identity over a set of even numbers, you can generalize to some other even numbers within constraints, like no longer than the one that you saw before, but you won't generalize to odd numbers. The network won't know what to do with the least significant bit. When I first presented that, in an article I submitted in 1998, or maybe I submitted in 97, I was accused of uh, launching a terrorist attack on connectionism, which is what neural networks were, were, were called then, um, by, by a reviewer. And the article was not published, and you know, eventually I got it published somewhere else. Um, it's actually the deepest issue with neural networks. It still is. It has been for 20-some years. It doesn't mean you can't build a neural network that 
can deal with this problem, but it does mean that the default for any neural network is that it will not generalize beyond the space of training examples that is seen. Bengio has now made this the core of the last seven or eight, well, la last three years of talks that he's given. Um, never, of course, citing me, but that's another story. Um, and I, I think you know people are starting to recognize it, but it is the number one reason why we must have some symbolic elements in our uh, systems. It could be that what we do is we make big, complicated, articulated neural networks with memory and so forth, and things that behave as symbols, and we never call them that. That's probably what's going to happen. But if you don't have the things that map onto symbols in there, you are not gonna solve this problem. Can we clear on a clear definition of generalization? First thing I would say about that is that you need to distinguish between um, oh, ben, Benjo understanding deep learning is the answer to everything. You should see the piece that he and I wrote together. That's a very interesting thing on that. We can talk about it later. Um, the, the important thing about generalization is to recognize what is on the slide. The first thing is to recognize there are two kinds of generalization. One that is within the space of training examples and the other that is outside that space of training examples. And what Benjo would call something like generalizing outside the distribution is the latter here. So neural networks of, of the sort of standard variety can do one kind of generalization that I have in green here and not the other. No definition of generalization that ignores the relation between the distribution of test examples and the distribution of training examples will ever suffice, it will always lead to confusion. And it has led to confusion um, for a few decades. Uh, some of these I'm going to miss. I'm happy to go through them later. I'm, I'm picking them out if they're kind of immediately relevant. Okay, so, so that was my argument for why we need neurosymbolic models is the neural networks themselves don't solve this problem unless they somehow incorporate symbols either explicitly or implicitly. <coughs> Second thing, um, although I think there's been growing appreciation of the importance of uh, neurosymbolic models, the notion of having large scale knowledge bases isn't as central in AI as it once was, and I think it still needs to be important. So much of what we know is abstract and general. Things like um, uh, BERT, GPT-3, and so forth know a lot of stuff, but they don't have it, I think, at the right level of representation. So we know a lot of stuff that <coughs> we can articulate at something like this level, um, or at least we can confirm if we're asked. If you break a bottle that contains a liquid, some of the liquid will, other things being equal, probably escape the bottle. We all know that that's true. Um, we may have never explicitly been asked before. Some people might have a harder time articulating, but pretty much anybody could say that that's true. I could give a different version um, that was false and people would recognize it as false. Systems like GPT aren't reliable when it comes to knowledge like this. So here are some examples from GPT two that I found, sometimes it comes up with continuations that are just not consistent with this. So if you break a glass bottle that holds toy, well, I guess it's not a perfect example of what I have on the left, but if you break a glass bottle that holds toy sol soldiers, the toy soldiers will probably follow you in there. It's nonsense. It does not reflect understanding of, of what a bottle is. And current systems just don't have real concepts of bottles, soldiers, liquids, and so forth. Uh, you're welcome. Um, without explicit manipulable knowledge, our models will remain uninterpretable and unreliable. It's just no way around this. And we need the knowledge. And what's more, if we don't have a way of putting that knowledge into our systems, our systems are crippled. So, you know, <coughs> human beings are systems that learn abstractions and details from data. A lot of it's culturally provided. A lot of it is explicit knowledge. And we wouldn't be where we are as individual human beings if we couldn't take knowledge from the outside and directly, excuse me, um, that's too bad I can't see myself. I'm sorry if I'm out of frame now. Um, <coughs> we can't directly um, input that, that kind of knowledge into our current systems. And that's a serious problem. It's also important, and I wish I had seen Josh Tenenbaum's talk yesterday because I think we're converging in a lot of ways. Um, it's really important that some part of that knowledge is um, innate problem. Well, let me say that sentence more carefully. Um, it is very clear that some in humans, some part of our knowledge, it's a small part of our knowledge, but foundational is innate. And probably our AI systems should also have some innate knowledge. And mostly the trend in AI for the last 15 years is to not have any innate knowledge, except maybe convolution or the structure of your transformer or something like that. 
What Spelke, um, great developmental psychologist at Harvard, has argued with respect to children <coughs> is a kind of learnability argument, something like Chomsky um, and Pinker ha have made in other domains. Um, if children are endowed innately with the abilities to perceive <coughs> objects, persons, sets, and places, then they may use their perceptual experience to learn about the properties and behaviors of such entities. Otherwise, she basically says it's not clear how to get off the ground. The point is, if you already know you are looking for things like objects, persons, sets, and places, you can learn about them. You can think of any classic computer program, like a database or word processor. You have some prior set of representations over which whatever information you accumulate is accumulated. So you, for example, if you have a Word document, then you have a database that is structured around the text and the formatting for the text and so forth. Well, we have kinds of minds that are structured around objects, persons, sets, and places. That doesn't preclude us from learning new ones. It's what allows us to learn new ones in the first place. And something like GPT-3 does not actually have a representation of an object, a person, a set, or a place. It only has representations of sequences of words, and that's not enough. We have to have ways to represent knowledge about space, time, and causality. Until we've really wrestled with those three things, I think the AI that we're doing is just not on the right track. Here's an example. We know how to represent <coughs> a cheese grater in terms of its physical structure. We could do a three-dimensional scan and feed that into a system. Um, we could build a large model of it in a video game and have a, a giant uh, grader and calculate when it, an object might collide with it. But we don't have any idea how to build a system that can look at a grader, relate its function to its form and understand which direction you should move the cheese in relative to the grater in order to get the slices. We just don't have that. Um, on the right, I have a picture from an AI magazine, AI, sorry, excuse me, AI journal article that Ernie Davis and I wrote <coughs> about representing containers. And we have a very complex flow chart. It's not crazy complex, but it's complex um, in terms of <coughs> representations of time and space and the history of things and actions and so forth in order to know basics about how space, time, and causality interact with respect to containers. I don't know if the paper's ever been cited. I haven't looked it up. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. Um, I suspect it's not a popular paper because it's <clears throat> kind of unrepentantly in a kind of classical AI framework. And what I would like to see is if people don't buy that, give us another way. And will it be the same module? So will it turn out that if you do a neural network system that actually understands the relations between entities and their con um, between containers and things inside them and so forth, will you be able to do without having modules for time, space, objects, manipulation, history, uh, et cetera? Like there, there's work out there, like Rob Fergus did some of the first, to do intuitive physics directly from pixels. But I don't think that approach has really gone anywhere. What we would say is you need actually rich and possibly logical representations in order to do the most basic reasoning about a container. I've yet to see anybody prove us wrong. I think instead people just work on other problems and haven't engaged. Um, there is nice recent work. Um, well, two things. So there's, I guess on the slide, I have AlphaFold, slightly old slide, but Al AlphaFold is a good example of how embedding <coughs> knowledge directly <coughs> excuse me, into the structure of a deep learning system really makes a difference. So AlphaFold, if it just learned from the raw data, <coughs> would not do very well. Instead, it's very structured around the physical problem that's encountered. So it's a good example of innateness. <clears throat> Reasoning and cognitive models have kind of put together in, in one slide or two, um, this particular example is drawn from a paper by Doug Lennett in Forbes in July 2019. And he showed <clears throat> that he could get the psych system, which is a rich um, system of human knowledge represented in machine interpretable form and a reasoner. <clears throat> he showed that given that knowledge, if you properly set up the story Romeo and Juliet, the system could derive really rich inferences. Like what would happen if Juliet, um, what did Juliet think would happen if she took the, the death potion? We don't have <coughs> anything remotely that powerful within a deep learning system. You know, the best we have is people do a little bit of ponen, modus ponens and call it a day. 
you know, if, a, if, um, if P <coughs> or P, P implies Q, P and therefore Q, that, that's like as far as people get, <coughs> they're like, great, we've got a deep learning system to do logic. <coughs> what Leonard has done here is far more complex and far more sophisticated. The catch is that there's no front end there <coughs> to actually extract the logical form. I think we should be thinking about that. So fundamentally, we need things like these if we're going to get further. I think if we <coughs> can get past the data and compute, th this attitude of data and compute will solve all problems, we can actually do this. Davis and I, this is a very complicated slide, but we had seven suggestions in our recent gradient.pub article that kind of elaborates on the last four that I gave you. And I, I wanted to summarize it in a single slide. I think if the field can do the seven things on this slide, we'd be in vastly better shape than we are now. So one is the rich cognitive models that keep track of the dynamically changing world. So if we're building a domestic robot, for example, we want to know what's in the house, who does the user work for, what's their favorite food, what do we expect today? We have a cognitive model of the current situation, extensive real world knowledge, you know, whether it's about what languages people speak or what different objects are for in a house representations of relations between those entities. So you should know not just, so if you see a video of a person drinking grape juice, you should realize not just, hey, I see grape juice, but you should realize that once the person um, has drunk that grape juice, that they'll be less thirsty and so forth. <clears throat> so you should understand the entities between the people, the things they're drinking, what it's gonna cause to happen in the person, et cetera. Compositionality, an agent has to understand holes in terms of their parts, so given the phrase, the, the woman who went up the mountain came down with a diamond. You should infer that the sentence is about a woman and the woman now has possessed the diamond. Going back to Lewis Lamb's point in the chat, we have systems that can now produce complicated sentences like these, but we have no demonstration that they actually understand the semantics that goes with those sentences. So do they know that if you say the woman went up a mountain and came down with a diamond, that that entails that she now has the diamond? Well, no, they don't. They might probabilistically sometimes get that, but they won't get it reliably. And we need common sense knowledge, especially around time, space, and causality, including fundamental categories like physical objects, mental states, and interpersonal interactions. We need reasoning. So you need to know that um, if you mix two non-toxic drinks, that the, the um, consequence will be another non-toxic drink, and that you can infer that if you drink it, you're not likely to die. Um, and we need human values. We need a representation of them in our AI system. <coughs> if we're going to use our AI systems in a lot of contexts. So a medical advice chatbot should not recommend suicide. We need a, a way of putting that in the model so that we trust that the system will do that. So as I said, there's a lot on this slide, um, but it's what I, it, it's my prescription for the field. If we get this, then I think we will have a sounder uh, foundation. Um, I, I gave a talk at an AGI conference. Um, it's nice to see that you can actually talk about AGI. It's kind of had a, a bad name. And I, I, I think we should actually be thinking about artificial general intelligence, that is. Um, and I, I kind of made a joke out of it um, by having this slide of, of protesters saying, what do we need? AGI, when do we want it now? And then asking, hey, but why don't we have it yet? And I, I think it's worth thinking about that too. So we're 66 years after the Dartmouth conference with, with McCarthy and Minsky and Newell and Simon and so forth. And we haven't solved AI yet. If you had told them back in the fifties that 66 years later, the stuff you're talking about is still basically going to be unsolved. Yeah. There'll be some progress and recommendation engines are going to work great and whatever. They would have been depressed. And then they would have come up with excuses. Well, they would have said, you know, maybe we didn't make progress because you know, computers are really expensive and they were then. And our computers don't really have enough memory to deal with the complexities of the real world. Well, that was true then, it's not true anymore. Or they might've said, we don't have enough data. I mean, they didn't think enough about data, frankly, but they might've used that as an excuse. And of course, now we have enough data or they might've said, well, there's not enough money invested in the field, which they were very worried about. Um, but, you know, by now there are billions and billions of dollars invested in unfathomably large amounts of compute, memory, money, data, um, and people interested in the field, like they were, they were, you know, a handful of people back then. And, and now, you know, conferences like NIPS with tens of thousands of people. So none of those things that might have occurred to them explain why we haven't solved AI yet. So he, here are some other, 
things. One is it's, it's clear that AI is harder than its originators realized. There's a famous thing about Minsky assigning vision as a summer project. And we know that vision is way too hard to do that because of all the variations in light and angle and occlusion and, and so forth. So that's part of it. Um, another part of it is that much too much research is siloed. There's way too little interdisciplinary collaboration. So right now, for example, the dominant paradigm in language is to use a transformer model. And those transformer models don't have anything to do with how linguists think about language. So there's a whole field. Most universities have a department of linguistics. And linguists think about things like semantics, back to Lewis Lamb's question. And there isn't even any discussion of semantics in large language models. And this is an example of how entirely siloed a lot of contemporary machine learning, deep learning, and really AI research is. Um, Another issue I think is the pendulum has swung too far towards machine learning. There was not enough machine learning in the early days, um, but it's all learning. And there's a, a logical fallacy that people make, which is they think the more things are learned, the less they need to be innate. But the reality is the more innate you have, the better you can do with the learning. But right now to, you know, to a man with a hammer, everything's a nail. People focus entirely on the learning part and not enough on the innate contributions. There is still, I think, not enough common sense represented in machine interpretable form. The biggest supply of such stuff is proprietary, which is psych, and probably it's not represented probabilistically enough for what we want to do. It was designed in the 80s, um, and although it's probably useful, it's probably not quite what we need, and nobody else is really working on that. Um, and I think we lack good mechanisms for integrating and acquiring abstract knowledge with machine learning. We have these two separate traditions, the abstract knowledge tradition and the machine learning tradition. Until we bring them together, we're stuck. So here's a summary, and then I'll try to take the rest of the questions here, and maybe there are others. Um, <coughs> COVID is a wake-up call. Um, it, and the complete failure of AI to contribute to it is a wake-up call. It's motivation for us to stop building AI for ad tech and news feeds and start building AI that can really make a difference. And I think there's a, a moral strand to this talk above and beyond the technical, and that's it, which is we need to be thinking about how AI can actually help us in the world. So deeper AI, for example, might um, be able to read, digest, and synthesize a, a vast and rapidly growing literature that's too big for individuals to process. That would be a great win. Um, deeper AI could help us monitor world preparedness. So the next time something like this happens, we'll be better prepared. AI will have noticed that we are not adequately prepared. There are all kinds of jobs now where we send in healthcare workers at risk. Um, be nice if robots powered by deeper AI could do some of those jobs. But to get to that level of AI that can operate in trustworthy ways, even in novel environments and novel regimes of data, we need to work towards building systems with deep understanding and not just deep learning. And I think the best way to get started on that journey is by focusing on hybrid, knowledge-driven, reasoning-based systems with rich cognitive models. I thank you very much. Maybe Artur will tell me what to do with the questions. Oh, I see uh, Steve Muggleton has one. We'll move to questions. Thank you very much.